Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for having me today. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, indeed, I'm Brett. I'm with the National Endowment. I'm coming from Washington, D.C. And um, I founded the Office of Digital Humanities at the NEH about 15 years ago. And uh, the, I'm excited about today's panel because uh, the projects we'll be talking about today are the, the kinds of projects I, I often fund um, at the NEH. So why don't we go ahead and jump right into things. Um, today's panel theme is indeed digital humanities and this panel explores how the digital public humanities are transforming the way scholars approach interpret and communicate within the humanities field we will have three scholars today doing papers um, the first person let me introduce her is dr natalia grincheva uh, an internationally recognized expert in innovative forms and global trends in contemporary museology digital diplomacy and international cultural relations her publication profile includes over 30 research articles, book chapters, and reports published in prominent academic outlets. Her most recent publications are two monographs, Museum Diplomacy in the Digital Age and Global Trends in Museum Diplomacy. Dr. Grincheva's paper, titled Reviving Cultural Relations in the Post-Pandemic World, Employing Geovisualization and AI to Leverage and Augment the Cultural Appeal of Museums, We'll explore the potential of two cutting edge digital approaches, geovisualization and AI, for mapping, assessing, and augmenting the digital soft power of museums in the post pandemic reality. Let me go ahead and kick it over to Dr. Grincheva. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm really delighted to be a part of this symposium. Thank you very much for bringing me to be a part of this. Uh, amazing team. I was so happy to see Sarah, uh, Antonio, and uh, I missed very much Professor <laughs> Sylvester. So it was amazing papers. I attentively listened to all of these uh, research developments, and this is great. I'm happy also to contribute to this discussion. So um, uh, the impact of COVID-19 global outbreak on the cultural sector has been devastating. The pandemic disrupted the international programs and long-term strategic plans of many museums, including their traveling exhibitions, object loans, international art residences, and commissioned work from artists abroad. Due to the economic crisis and the financial instabilities, institutional resources are understandably scarce. And museums, especially those operating internationally, require new methodological approaches for allocating and investing their resources so that they can deliver outcomes and maximize impacts in different geographic areas, depending on local challenges and opportunities. So my research drives attempts to address these issues and argues that geovisualization and machine learning can actually assist with the development of new methods, not only for measuring, but also for predicting soft power impacts of museums and their activities. So specifically, geovisualization, machine learning, and the artificial intelligence enabled solutions can assist cultural institutions to accurately evaluate the return value of their activities, make better use of their institutional resources and pursue more effective strategies for maximizing their cultural appeal and soft power reach in the post-pandemic environment. In my presentation today, I specifically focus on the practice-based research project developed in collaboration with the Australian Center for the Moon Image to create a first-in-the-world dynamic web application that can measure and map museum soft power. Uh, having tools in the State Film Center, ACME, my partner in this research project, was founded in 2002 to house the nation's largest collection of moving image documents ranging from films to digital arts and installations. Being a partner on this project, the ACME had been very helpful because it provided a lot of data about its collections, about its uh, international connections, about uh, its uh, visitation numbers in different geographic locations uh, to uh, develop the tool uh, of measuring museum soft power. So the project employed geovisualization, data mining, and digital storytelling to uh, develop this mapping solution a mapping application that can demonstrate uh, museum global influence across 
five key layers of soft power from mere resources to social outputs and to finally to local outcomes, cultural and both economic. Uh, before I proceed with my presentation, let me just step back a little bit to clarify the background information about the project. So first of all, what exactly does this map aim to measure and visualize? Uh, what is soft power in the first instance? So soft power, and uh, I think uh, the majority of our audience would know anyway, is the term first coined by American professor of international relations, Joseph Nye, to describe the ability of a country to influence behavior of others through persuasion, attraction, and agenda setting. A country on the international stage can achieve influence by building networks, communicating compelling narratives, establishing international rules, and drawing on the resources that make a country nationally, uh, naturally attractive to the world. A nation soft power is increasingly subject to measurement with Portland Soft Power 40 uh, and a Global Power City Index reports providing evidence of this trend. These initiatives have generated a series of global indicators based on culture, education, science, uh, politics, and economy to annually assess the extent to which nations have risen through or declined upon these indices. So challenging these attempts to measure soft power, my research uh, reconfigures this framework of soft power evaluations by stressing three important points that have been overlooked in the previous research. So first, I combine various methods of soft power evaluation that previously were used separately. And these approaches include resources, outputs, outcomes, perceptions, and networks evaluation models. Uh, through my research, I developed a new integrative approach that can comprehensively combine different methods to construct a more advanced tool to measure soft power. Furthermore, I employ the cause-effect model to frame various approaches of soft power evaluation. Because uh, in order to assess soft power, on the one hand, it is necessary to evaluate agents' resources, capabilities, and behaviors. On the other hand, though, the assessment should include analysis of perceptions, affections, and responses of subjects. So second, I argue that previously proposed evaluation approaches could be improved through uh, mapping or geovisualization. Uh, so it is not really productive to measures of power in general terms, assuming that the power appeal of a particular country or actor is the same in different geographic locations. Instead, I employ cultural analytics and city statistics of a specific location and look at secondary factors, for example, cultural diversity and vibrancy, local language and religion, to evaluate the soft power appeal to people living in this particular area not in general terms. So finally, I argue that measuring soft power of a whole country is misleading, since these evaluations don't take into consideration the multifaceted and complex nature of different and very often competing actors within the country who generate and exert different degrees of soft power upon global publics. Uh, instead, I focus on museums as important actors in the international arena, which have their distinctive identities, brands, audiences, and followers. So in the era of digital globalization, museums have transformed from publicly funded cultural heritage repositories to key actors of creative economy and new centers of soft power. And the global outbreak of COVID-19 virus has forced museums and galleries worldwide to reinforce their distributed nature. Museums increasingly operate as hybrid institutions existing between physical and virtual worlds, projecting their attraction power through new tools, including augmented reality, mixed reality, virtual reality, mobile devices, and digital technologies. So the multi-layered map and project aim to produce a system that allows a user to assess and visualize the influence of ACME on several inter interconnected levels. It included mapping the museum collections, uh, digital and physical audiences, international network of institutional connections and partnerships, as well as local impacts of ACME touring exhibitions. Each of these layers in the system measures the attraction power in different countries by calculating a power index. 
a weighted sum of several key normalized indicators based on specific data in correlation to social demographic variables for each country or city on the global map. So the scale from zero to 100 for each of these indices allows a comparison of different countries and in combination with color coding, the system reveals geographic areas of missed opportunities and identify also zones of maximum influence. Uh, let me now go to the application and demonstrate how it works. So um, here is the uh, application, which is actually available online. Uh, there is a link that I can share with everybody to explore it later and to uh, play with this tool. Uh, so, uh, and as I said, it measures soft power of Australian set of the moon inch on five layers. So let's start with the collection appeal power layer, uh, which actually demonstrates the potential appeal of ACME collection to attract audiences from different countries. So, uh, it correlates multiple sets of data that on the one hand uh, measures the linguistic diversity of films and uh, uh, ACME uh, collection has films in 49 different languages. It also kind of uh, demonstrates where the, the origin of this film, where they come from. And it's very interesting that because the 70% of ACME collections actually come uh, from uh, countries uh, beyond Australia. So, and it correlates uh, this type of uh, collection diversity data with the digital uh, and physical mobility of the population of each country to kind of expose the uh, discoverability potential of uh, this collection. So you can see with the intensity of the green that like ACME collection actually uh, can potentially appeal to many countries, uh, including in North America, Europe, and Asia Pacific. But this is very interesting. If you go to the next level, online engagement power, it actually shows where these audiences come from and how do they connect to ACME through different channels. And the intensity of the blue here indicates that uh, there are not so many uh, audiences online that connects with this uh, ACME collection. So most of them come from North America and Europe and uh, uh, Asia Pacific region uh, uh, stays relatively untapped. So this uh, data actually correlates online visitation data with social media engagement uh, and some other social media uh, channels. So uh, the interesting situation with China and Taiwan and uh, uh, Taiwan being a, a part of China, it has online engagement power uh, 33 which is pretty okay in comparison to other countries, and which is really high in comparison to China, which uh, uh, is just zero, meaning that there are uh, th this uh, uh, there is a black hole in this mapping indicating that. Uh, uh, it, it is not possible to actually measure the online engagement of China because China is not so well connected through uh, all the channels that uh, ACME actually uses in order to outreach to international audiences. So uh, let me go to the next layer, which is global connectivity power layer, and it visualizes all the connections between ACME and 185 institutions around the world, uh, I think in around 80 different cities. So for example, if we go to Europe, uh, one of the most engaged countries uh, is Germany with global connectivity power uh, reaching 100. And you can see here how many different organizations in different cities in Germany are connected with ACME through different relationships. And uh, in each particular city, we can explore these connections further. We also try to measure uh, the strength and durability of these collections that actually range from very weak, uh, only just, you know, exchange kind of uh, connections and progressing to very strong uh, institutional and long-term partnerships. So let me now go to the next layer uh, that uh, actually measures uh, the traveling exhibition uh, impacts uh, of ACME around the world. In the last 15 years, it's toured different exhibitions to different countries. 
And uh, uh, in each particular case, we tried to measure this attraction power of this exhibition in this particular city by correlating three different sets of data, including the museum context, looking at global audiences and digital representation of the hosting museum space, looking also at urban context index and exploring the global exposure and cultural infrastructure of this particular city. And also looking at the attraction power, the exhibition itself. Again, uh, we have multiple stories about all these exhibitions and what happened in each particular um, city. So uh, let me now go back to my slides and tell you a little bit more about um, um, another layer that uh, was launched most uh, recently. In May 2019, the Museums of Power Map application launched a new layer, the Local Engagement Power Forecast. It predicts the soft power of the most uh, recent Acme Turin exhibition, Wonderland, that was exceptionally well received in Melbourne in 2018, inviting almost 200,000 on site visitors. And this layer forecast the attraction power of this an exhibition in potential hosting cities across continents. For example, among 17 potential cities where Wonderland might travel in the next decade from Los Angeles to Taipei, the prediction model of linear regression forecasted Singapore and Wellington in New Zealand to be among the most leading uh, receiving cities in the Asia Pacific with the local engagement power forecast indices reaching 59 and 78 respectively. So this forecast is based on the first iteration of input data collected from a series of uh, DreamWorks animation blockbuster exhibition that proved to be also highly successful in, among Asia Pacific audiences. And this exhibition traveled in the region in 2015 up to uh, 2017 and was hosted by a number of museums, including the Art Science Museum in Singapore, the Papa Museum in New Zealand and Seoul Museum of Art in South Korea. So the Wonderland's actual visitation numbers recently collected from Art Science and the Papa Museums, in fact, prove that forecast calculations uh, to be quite accurate. And the second iteration input information uh, provided uh, valuable data to feed the local attraction forecast machine learning algorithm that will obtain a high degree of precision once Wonderland and other future exhibitions of ACME will travel to other cities across the globe, generating different attraction power in different locations to supply more input data. In conclusion, I wanted to share that based on this pilot project, I'm currently working in collaboration with the Digital Diplomacy Research Center at the University of Oxford on the new project that aims to advance this cultural mapping and artificially intelligent enabled solutions. And the new research project in partnerships with several actual museums from three cities, London, Melbourne, and Singapore will commence in September this year, and it will draw on the critical digital practice methodology to experiment with existing data collected from participating museums to prototype new solutions, more advanced solutions for assessing and predicting soft power of museums, including by harnessing the power of artificial intelligence to identify and predict patterns of digital cultural engagement. So I'm happy to answer all your questions and please feel free to connect if you would like to continue a discussion beyond the space. But uh, again, it was a pleasure to be a part of this uh, uh, symposium. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Grincheva. Really appreciate it. That was a terrific presentation. Um, I, did, I did have a question. Um, you know, I, I actually have a, a grant program. It's a joint program with the UK government and it's very much in this area. It's, um, it's funding cultural analytics based research projects at museums and galleries and other cultural institutions. And one of the things that we have noticed, um, certainly in the UK and the US is that while there are some museums that are very digitally savvy, they collect a lot of data, they know how to use it, and they have staff that understand how to use it. There's also a lot of museums that don't play in that space at all. Now, I was curious, I guess it's sort of a two part question from your experience in Australia and other places. Is that the case kind of globally or are museums a little bit more digitally savvy in Australia? And I guess part B, um, when a museum doesn't have that expertise, can they still take advantage 
of um, uh, of your of your software, or are there other steps they need to take in order to get there? Uh, thank you so much, Brad. This is a really interesting question. And actually, I received similar questions many times when I presented this research. So yes, indeed, our, uh, the situation, the first <laughs> answer to your question, the situation is global. It's just everywhere. There are uh, museums who are more digitally savvy, who are uh, always ready, who are innovative, that uh, goes forward uh, with a step by step with their development uh, and innovations. And there are museums uh, that are not so fast in this domain and uh, remain in the shadow when it concerns digital communication and digital engagement. So uh, yes, uh, again, it depends uh, in many cases on their uh, budget of these institutions uh, uh, and their, uh, how significant how major how large these institutions how uh, you know well funded uh, they are uh, rather by public or private funds uh, uh, so yeah it, it depends on the institutional capacity to actually you know engage with uh, digital tools because uh, it's expensive <laughs> it's not that easy it requires uh, human resources it requires expertise it, it requires uh, a, a lot of actually time because even to digitize the collection it takes decades for, <laughs> depending on the collection so it, it, it requires a, a lot of resources good funding and uh, right experts who can lead this Right, because right. it takes a lot of human efforts to push this agenda forward in each institution, considering how bureaucratic these institutions might be, especially if they're big institutions and if they are uh, publicly funded or funded by the governments. So, yes, indeed, in order to get advantage of the software that I am developing, uh, yes, of course, there <laughs> certain steps <laughs> are needed yeah. to be taken because uh, uh, the system is actually actually designed to aggregate, automatically aggregate data. Because uh, in order for me, for example, to collect all the data uh, manually, it would take me, you know, years, you know? So uh, instead of that, the system actually aggregates the data that already exists, that already uh, was harnessed, uh, collected, you know, stored by the institution itself. And it just, you know, transform it into a digital storytelling kind of tool to demonstrate uh, what this data is about, how we can use this data to uh, you know, maximize uh, our potentials in different uh, locations around the world. So yeah, because when I started to go with this application uh, with these different demos in different countries, I've got a lot of requests. Oh, please, can, can, can you come to our institution and, and do a similar thing? Uh, and then like, when I realized that there is no, uh, you know, channels through which I can aggregate the data, or there is no digital collection or no digital uh, catalog of the collection, or uh, the institution doesn't have any records going back in terms of their visitation numbers or ticket sales, then it's a problem. Then it's a problem. Then it first needs to be digitized and, you know, <laughs> stored properly and saved and, and then moved forward to another Got it. level. That makes perfect sense. It, it's definitely uh, agrees with what we've seen in the, here in the U.S. and what I've learned from the U.K. as well. So thank you very much. I think we're just about out of time. So thank you so much. And, and, and I know that you're calling from Australia, so it's very, very late where you are. So I, 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 I appreciate it very much that you could participate. And it was a terrific presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brad, and uh, thank you again uh, for uh, the organizers of this symposium. It's amazing and it's timely, it's uh, needed, and I had a blast uh, listening to all the papers and seeing some familiar faces. Bye-bye, <laughs> so <laughs> have a good day. Great, thank you so much. Okay, terrific. Um, our next paper is going to be from Casey Haddock. Uh, Casey Haddock is an archeologist and received a master's degree in world heritage and cultural projects for development from the University of Turin. Haddock is currently the Director of Conservation Programs at SciArc, a nonprofit organization dedicated to digitally preserving cultural heritage. His paper, titled Online Training in 3D Documentation and Storytelling, reflects on a 2020 collaboration between SciArc, Story Center, 
the English language program at the U.S. Embassy in Amman, and Madaba Regional Archaeological Museum Project. It provided online workshops to local stakeholders in Madaba, Jordan. Um, Casey Haddock, please go ahead with your presentation. Thank you very much, Brett. Um, I'm really excited to be here and contribute and, and learn, uh, learn so much from all these amazing colleagues. So thank you very much. Um, like you mentioned, um, today I'll be talking about a really exciting project that I, I had the privilege of working on. And as you mentioned, a few of the stakeholders, there were a lot. And I think that's one of the beauties of, of the pandemic, if there can be anything good, is that it's allowed us to engage with a lot more stakeholders than we've typically um, worked with in the past. And, um, and like you said, I'll be um, talking about this project, um, which, which um, reflected a collaboration between Jordanian and American professionals, um, which was launched just a few months ago um, that took place most of the work during, during the pandemic. So um, go ahead and transition. Um, and so this project was funded by the Cultural Antiquities Task Force from the US Department of State. So before I jump into the project, I want to provide a little background about CIRC, um, the nonprofit organization that I work for. We are based in the San Francisco Bay Area, and but we work globally for the preservation of cultural heritage. And so CIRC uses digital tools like laser scanning and photogrammetry to generate these really incredibly um, dense um, 3D models of heritage sites. And so this data um, can be used to support the protection of these places, but also can serve as the basis for creating these place-based experiences. And so since the pandemic, like Dr. Greencheva was mentioning, we've been helping sites and cultural institutions make this transition to the digital space um, using some of the methodologies we've developed. Um, and so you can see there's there's three main areas where we work, this interpretation and education, where we whereby we use 3D models and other immersive media to raise awareness or educate the public. Um, these accurate 3D models can be combined with audio or video, um, and they can be used to tell a story. And we've developed a number of virtual reality experiences, including um, a prototype experience funded by the NEH, um, that provide virtual access to places and can be used um, as a canvas for telling, telling stories and sometimes stories that, that are not often told at these places. The second area that we work is the conservation and management. Again, this is where the majority of my work takes place. So these same 3D models that can be used to educate the public can also be used to map or monitor damage or understand problems. A lot of the places that we work at are affected by climate change. And so this high resolution 3D data um, of every surface of these monuments empowers local site managers with quantifiable data that they can use to make decisions and plan restoration efforts. And the final area that we work is in open access. And so um, CIRC strives to share all the data that we collect um, freely. Um, and so we support this through publishing our data with Creative Commons licensings, which supports academic and artistic reuse. Um, and so like with many of our projects at CIRC, um, the project in Madaba, Jordan, uh, that I'll be talking about today, involved working in all three of these areas where CIRC works. Um, so since our founding in 2003, CIRC has documented um, or provided training in our methods at over 250 sites around the world. Uh, we often collaborate with local ministries of culture and U.S. embassies and consulates around the world, um, which has typically been accomplished through in-person expeditions that last from anywhere from one to four weeks. Um, however, since the pandemic, um, CIRC has been working a lot more virtually. And so we've been um, accomplishing our, our mission through virtual trainings in our methods um, and, uh, and virtual workshops in, in, in different, um, different aspects of the work that we complete. Uh, so these online experiences, we, we've developed an online platform called 3D Virtual Tours um, that we uh, that allow site managers um, and communities to use these to these experiences online to provide access um, to these places that many of them have been closed during the pandemic. Um, and so the One Place Mini Stories project in Manaba was an example uh, of one of these programs. Uh, and it was designed to support the, the community of Madaba, which is, is a, a site located in, in south of the capital of Amman which was devastated, like many communities, by the loss of tourism from the COVID-19 pandemic. 
And so this project involved partnering with a number of Jordanian American organizations to identify local participants and then to provide training uh, in order to develop this, this virtual experience. Um, and the city of Madaba is, is located, like I said, southwest of Amman. And it's, it's one of these cities that is famous for um, Byzantine, a number of Byzantine period mosaics. And so it is also one of the, the home to uh, the oldest known mosaic of the Holy Land. And uh, there's a number of historic sites. The, the Department of uh, State is working on supporting uh, the development of a new museum in the city of Madaba. And so this community is really um, well positioned to, to undertake a project to provide virtual access to some of these places. Um, so one of the principal components of the One Place Mini Stories project that I'll be sharing today was a virtual workshop in Cyrix Methods. Um, and so we identified together with our local partners a group at the, universe, the American University of Madaba, the Faculty of Architecture. And so in advance of this virtual workshop, participants were shipped an inexpensive kit, less than $1,700 in advance of the workshop, which mirrored Cyrix's own equipment that we use on our typical field projects. So this off the shelf kit uses uh, a technology called photogrammetry, which is a process that uses overlapping photos taken in a very regimented way to develop these really accurate 3D models. And so we're talking about many thousands of pictures taken um, all around in different corners of the site. And these are brought together in the software to generate the 3D models. And so the, the virtual workshop, we're not talking about weeks and weeks of workshop on this project. We, we provided instruction over four days. And, and then following the, the workshop, the participants from the university were able to immediately apply what they learned to the documentation of three sites in the historic city or the, the central of downtown Madaba. Um, so, like I mentioned, local participants took thousands of photos all around these places um, and then shared that data back with us through the power of um, uh, file transfer, file transfer software. And so we could review that data, make sure that all of the areas were captured, and then provide any feedback in advance of the next day's work. Um, and so, um, like I mentioned, I think the, the, the participants took around 10,000 photographs of these three locations. This uh, St. George Church, which is the location where the, this incredible mosaic of the Holy Land, um, all written in Greek, is found, as well as two other important sites. Another historic church, um, which is famous for uh, mosaics um, depicting some of the Greek myths, um, and, as well as um, uh, a palatial residence. And so, so the, the university participants and um, we're not the only pe people from Madaba that received a workshop. We also partnered with Story Centered, like Brett mentioned, which is another nonprofit organization here in the Bay Area um, that provides workshops on, on storytelling. And so with Story Center, we worked with six community members to record personal memories of, of these historic sites. and. Um, they may be beautiful to look at for us, but um, through, through these stories, we were able to hear on why these places are so important to the local community. And so um, from stories uh, about how um, people used to play on those mosaics growing up um, all the way to the present day. And so again, through this project, we were trying to, to collect and record the, these stories to, to provide a platform to tell the perspective from someone from Madaba about these places. And so again, all of these stories were, were recorded in Arabic and English so that we could have dual language versions of the final experience. Um, and then in addition to the community members, we also worked with uh, tour guides, so a number of tour guides of Madaba who typically take tourists um, to the city on in-person visits to these historic places. We were able to record them through video conferencing, kind of giving us a tour of these three historic sites um, as if we were there in person. And again, um, as with the community members, we recorded them both in Arabic and English, um, providing narration 
also connecting with the place. I think this church that we're seeing here, this is showing the, the mosaic map on the floor, but this was actually one of the locations where one of the tour guides was married. It was the same church. And so again, telling these stories of why this place is so important. Um, and then um, together we were able to um, combine all of that audio and video collected from the tour guides and the community members to generate three um, uh, virtual tour experiences of these three sites. And so again, you see six here because we have both Arabic and English language versions. Um, but these these tours take take you through Madaba um, with with a with a local providing the the narration on on what you're seeing, and you can you can either explore on your own or kind of engage with the media that the, the tour guides and community members share with you. And so I just have a, a, a quick kind of video to show a little bit of what what that looks like. Um, let's see if it's gonna load for me. Um, and now. Let's go inside the St. George Church to really see what makes this church special and unique. Once so we enter inside the church, just to our right on the floor, we can see a remarkable mosaic. It's a beautiful... Come to the next slide. Yeah, so in this experience, we have the tour guide kind of narrating what you're seeing of the mosaic floors. And again, in this map, you see all of the principal historic sites in Madaba and then throughout um, the other cities in, in the region. Um, you even have Jerusalem. And so these this audio and video were brought together in this platform that is embeddable on, on partner websites as well. And so um, the beauty of, of having all of these partners on this project is that we could share the resulting experience through these different platforms. Um, and so uh, we, as you can see, the results are, are truly incredible. I think the, the participants from the American University of Madaba took what they learned and over that four days, and they were able to generate these incredible 3D models of these places that really um, kind of provide that sense of place, um, which is augmented by the audio and video um, from the tour guides and community members. And so you really um, are able to see, again, the, the, the university participants took four days to document these places, taking around 10,000 photos. And so in, in just eight days, we, we have these results that we're able to share with the public in this final experience. And so in addition to this kind of dynamic educational experience that can be embedded um, on, on Cyrix website as well as partner websites, um, we were also able to share the data um, that was collected uh, on our um, Open Heritage 3D, which is a, a repository for cultural heritage data. And so again, uh, the idea with this publication is that that this data can live on beside, beyond this project. I think these, these images and 3D data may have use in the future because it provides a really accurate, comprehensive um, model or point in time record of this place. And so um, again, each of these data sets from these three locations was assigned a, a digital object identifier and, and you can um, download this data free of charge and, and reuse it and remix it as you see fit. Um, so I think, again, partnering with the Cultural Antiquities Task Force, this experience, we, we wanted to really explain how, how these cultural heritage sites um, are, why are there the multi-layered benefits that they provide to the community. And I think this was really exciting to, to SIARC as we saw the, the ability to, to provide training um, to our partners abroad and, and getting really incredible results um, in just a short amount of time. And so we've been able to replicate this with several other um, uh, consulates and around the world and so um, this has been an exciting way that we can not only provide virtual access through through a, a, a virtual workshop on 3d documentation but we can also as well strengthen local communities with these exchanges of skills and and then in the final experience promote the protection and respect for these places um, by, by kind of in, including all of those different levels of meaning and importance that these places share to local communities. Um, yeah, um, I think that's 
Yeah, and I encourage you all, I kind of in wrapping it up, um, to experience the, the, the site for yourself. On, I've included the link here. Um, you can go through each of the experiences in Arabic and English and, and kind of engage with the different pieces of media, um, watch the videos, and, and learn about all the different ways that, that Madaba is important to the local community. Thanks so much. All right, fantastic. Thank you very much, Casey. We appreciate it. That was a terrific presentation. What we're going to do now, we're going to jump right into our third presentation. And then when that's over, we'll loop back and we'll do some Q&A for the last two presentations. So let me go ahead now and introduce our third speaker. Um, Hannah Wang is a co-founder of Gesso, a location-based audio platform for exploring cities and museums. Prior to launching Gesso, she has worked across the arts and social impact sectors at institutions such as Sotheby's, Phillips, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the Smithsonian's Freer Gallery of Art and, Sackler, and Arthur M. Sackler Gallery. Wang holds a Bachelor of Arts in Art History and Economics from Bucknell University and a Master of Science in Culture and Society from the London School of Economics. Her paper titled Exploring the Humanities Through Audio AR uses the case study of Paris in New York, the collaboration between Gesso and the cultural services of the Embassy of France to explore the way immersive audio technology adds another dimension to the digital humanities. Um, Hannah Wang, please go ahead with your presentation. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's such an honor to be part of this prestigious panel. Um, today, uh, we're going to be talking about exploring the humanities through audio AR. Um, my name is Hannah Wong. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Gesso, as Brett has mentioned. Um, uh, before I dive in, um, you might be wondering, um, what is audio AR? You might have heard of VR, AR. Um, I'll get into that in a second. Um, secondly, I'll talk about the evolution of audio AR for storytelling as part of um, our team's experience, um, as well as I'll share um, some case studies that sort of support the, um, the, the, or illustrate the power and potential of this technology. And then lastly, um, I'll show you a few ways uh, that you can um, used to leverage uh, the technology that we've built so that your institutions uh, don't have to um, build the technology from scratch. Now, what is audio AR? Audio AR is um, essentially the overlaying of the physical world with a virtual layer of audio. And what that means is really location-based audio. Imagine walking around, uh, walking down the street and being able to hear um, the story of that building that you've always wondered about but never um, looked up or um, really uh, hearing uh, an audio documentary or audio journalism delivered through your headphones as if it were a whisper, as if a good friend were showing, showing you around a gallery, um, a museum, uh, or, or city streets, uh, or if you're uh, on a road trip, um, being able to access stories uh, of the places as you're passing. And why does audio AR matter? And how does it further cultural diplomacy? Um, we've, uh, the, the word empathy has come up a lot uh, in today's panel, and really that is the foundation of what we do. Um, empathy is, a, is the foundation of mutual understanding and grassroots diplomacy. Really being able to hear about um, different people's experiences, we're realizing um, with the lack um, especially the racial reckoning happening here in the US over the last year, that um, media is broken, um, that uh, are really these diverse stories need to be told and these diverse stories bind us. I'd love for you to think about a place that's important to you. And while you're doing that, um, I'll share a place that's important to me. Um, we're looking at the building, uh, the mid-century modern building uh, in the middle there. Um, what I can tell you about this, this is um, the Apollo Memorial Library located 40 minutes outside of Pittsburgh. Um, and 
if you read the Wikipedia page or if you read the About Us page on, on the library's website, um, it might tell you that it was the first library that was built in the county in the late 1800s. The building you see today uh, was built in 1963. But what is not mentioned is um, in the early 2000s, the, the library was on the verge of shutdown. And um, my mother uh, grew up during the Cultural Revolution. Um, her schooling was interrupted at the age of seven until she was uh, 18. Um, and she self-taught. She uh, studied um, in the libraries that were, um, that remained open, the limited reading rooms that were open throughout China. Um, and when she had an opportunity to come to the States to study in the early 80s, she, uh, no surprise, uh, studied library science and became a librarian. So this was where she had her first job. Um, and back to the thread on the library on the verge of shutdown in the early 2000s, my mother flew from Taiwan, where we were living at the time, to throw a fundraiser to save this library. And so, in a way, these are the hidden stories that really inspire us, that, um, that are beneath the surface, that celebrate in the individuals who, who shape culture and continue to shape our heritage and legacy. This is a picture of her, <laughs> uh, taken in the uh, early 80s. Um, and she's very much the reason why I started Gesso, because I realized that places and objects contain stories of people who shape culture. I wanted to give a little shout out to my teammates as well. Um, I'm the person on the, uh, the left there. Um, the person in the middle is Demetrio, um, and the person on the right is Michael, um, and we are three third cultural kids. Um, and the experience of moving around and adapting to different cultures uh, during our upbringing really um, brought us together. I found that the common thread of needing to adapt um, and um, forever be ob observers uh, in a new place um, made us nerds about uh, the, the layers of history that's tucked just beneath the surface. We're all about celebrating the wonder in the world through sound and we're ironically encourage the pleasure of getting lost for the sake of knowledge. We map the world's art and history through spatial audio for the seekers and explorers. And in that, in the process, revealing beauty in the ordinary, um, connecting strangers who share more than they'd ever expect. Um, and we, we strive to be a catalyst for the discovery of culture. Um, we're really telling what we want to do with Gesso um, is being that foundational layer, that primer beneath it all, that unsung hero that um, creates the scaffolding so that to elevate other people's um, worldviews. Um, so for curious listeners near us and, and far, um, we're really telling the story of humanity through audio and um, in doing so creating a better society where we can thrive together. With that really grandiose uh, vision, um, we thought that technology should be a bridge and not a barrier. My co-founders are, are technologists and um, as Brett introduced, um, I'm a sociologist and, and, a, and an art historian. Um, and so the three of us, when we came together, initially we thought we could tackle um, inequality through museum tech because at the time uh, we started four years ago, um, Bloomberg Philanthropies uh, spent $100 million supporting only 15 museums in their digital engagement. Of course, Brett, your work um, through uh, NEH uh, has supported many more institutions in being able to engage and make their collections more accessible uh, and inclusive to the public. And where we thought we could come in is serving the 90% of museums that don't have access to resources of funding and um, enabling um, or in making this tool that could democratize storytelling available to institutions of all sizes. Um, and then we, um, we thought, of course, stories about places and culture, cultural experiences extend beyond the walls of museums. And so we started set, um, making podcasts that were about places. Um, here we interviewed the, um, one of the co-founders of the Highline, um, where he 
recounts the his memory of first uh, stepping foot onto this abandoned rail yard here in New York, and it felt like a dream, like uh, a New Yorker where space is um, really precious, that uh, you had stumbled upon a hidden room that you didn't know existed before. Um, and then we thought, um, actually, what would be um, really powerful is being able to tell stories in context while you're out exploring. So um, during the pandemic, we uh, created 500 uh, one to two minute micro podcasts that are geotagged. Um, so as you're walking down the street, you can um, walk past uh, uh, Jean-Michel Jean Bastia's old studio um, that is now a restaurant. Um, you can um, uh, go uh, visit the church where Patti Smith first stepped up to, to read her electric poetry, um, really tracing the birth of punk and uh, understanding or uh, kind of um, un unpacking what what, it, what is hipsterism? What is a sociological look at um, the gentrification um, or the um, Soho effect um, that has uh, permeated throughout the world um, in urban centers? Um, and then we wanted to take it, take audio AR even a step further. Um, Devin, do you mind playing this video? Revel in the seemingly unending field ahead the mysticism at play in this pastoral paradise tucked between bustling neighborhoods. Perhaps take a moment and peek at whose loved ones are memorialized on tiny plaques at the bench corners. As the path begins to slope downhill, look right. That brick building across the meadow is the picnic house. A number of picnic shelters were built in the late 1800s as larger groups of 100 plus clamored to gather in the park. Thank you for that. Um, this is just a short demo of how our app works as you're um, discovering a landscape where we like to call these kinetic documentaries or sound blocks. And of course the idea of sound blocks is not new. Um, there are artists um, dating back to the 70s um, through to the 90s uh, using evolving technologies like cassettes and um, CDs and uh, delivering these experiences through Walkman. Um, of course, now um, there are different technology platforms that you can leverage, uh, whether it's through podcasting channels or sound, um, uh, like SoundCloud or Spotify, but those uh, don't uh, aren't uh, location specific. And so we wanted to build something that really encourage this, again, um, pleasure of getting lost. So if someone wanted to take a detour, um, the next segment won't play until they get there. Imagine uh, experiencing the world through uh, both nonfiction and fiction, um, a murder mystery that's set in place um, that has some historical re relevance um, is something that um, uh, our projects or examples that have pop popped up in this space uh, in the past. And so the result is a, um, that we built Gesso as a home for stories about place. Um, and where we, um, so that includes muse official museum guides, um, these self-guided walks or audio tours, um, and then these linear, really narrative, immersive uh, experiences as well. Um, and then I'll share a few case studies. Um, and as Brett mentioned, um, last year ahead of Bastille Day, um, when every, everything was virtual, um, we partnered with the, um, with the cultural services of the French Embassy, um, it's based in, here in New York, um, to celebrate the long-standing friendship between um, France and America uh, through uh, six stops that are here in New York, um, pardon me, I'm based in Brooklyn, so this is very New York-centric, um, but uh, anywhere from the Statue of Liberty to um, the uh, Iron Gates um, uh, at the um, uh, at the zoo, um, anywhere from an apartment building to um, a beloved bookstore. Um, so the uh, the deputy cultural counselor narrated this, uh, and uh, it continues to live on, even though it was created last year. Um, and it's something that people can explore uh, on their own. Um, whether they want to, they prefer remotely or in person. Um, this is a group that we uh, 
recently collaborated with their Elmhurst Queens-based um, food activists who uh, wanted to shed light on um, the, the restaurants that are based in Queens and really celebrate them. Um, Elmhurst was an epicenter of the academic, many frontline workers who serve, um, uh, who, who work in the service industry and health industry uh, live in Elmhurst. So they created this food crawl and, and fundraised um, for a local food pantry. Um, during the food crawl, crawl um, participants can also listen to, uh, to interviews with restaurant owners. Uh, we also had an um, artist and magician uh, based in Chicago who was commissioned by the MCA Chicago, uh, created a, a set of invisible museums while the um, while MCA Chicago was closed to the public. This was something that people can do socially distanced outdoors. Um, and then we also had a group of artists um, here in, um, in New York create a sound walk through Harlem that was, um, according to the New York Times, a impressionistic audio response of a real to a real event of a, a deer, a one antler deer wandering through Harlem. For those of you who are surrounded by nature, this might not sound strange, but it certainly is um, in a concrete jungle, like where I am now. Um, and then as, we're, uh, as we were making our Brooklyn Bridge audio walk, um, protests broke out uh, last May um, in response to the murder of George Floyd. We were there and captured um, audio and were able to um, really focus on how this landmark not only is an engineering marvel, but what it means to the world in connecting ideas, be it protest, be it love, be it, um, be it intellect. Uh, I wanted to invite you to leverage our technology to tell stories as well. What's really important to us is the ability um, to offer our listeners an experience of, uh, or um, an opportunity for people to build empathy, to walk a mile in someone else's shoes. And so we built a creator tool where um, you, can, you can leverage and Basically, you can drop a pin for, for if you're creating a location-based audio experience, audio walk or audio tour, you can drop a pin on a map, attach a, an image, attach an audio file, um, title it, and then string them together to make an audio, a linear audio tour that's thematic or a self-guided one where um, so much of the emphasis is uh, the exploration of the in-between as well. And then for cultural institutions, we have a, a, a a section of this admin where you can create a branded module for your institution that um, has your logo and um, color schemes as well. Um, and then many people, many of the uh, partners that we've worked with, um, of which we've um, we've worked with about 60 institutions now, um, are daunted by the process of uh, producing their audio uh, content and fret not, um, it really isn't that complicated. We have um, a four, really, a, it can be broken down to four steps. So working with curators or experts to write um, and then uh, we have resources and, and tips on how to record yourself um, and then how to really simple tools to edit. And then really lastly, um, testing and iterating and publishing and our team is on hand to support with that process. Um, for example, the Queen's Museum was able to, let, or to um, incorporate archival audio that was taken from um, one of the World's Fairs um, about the panorama that is on view in their museum. And um, really most of the audio guide was created with um, the educator's uh, iPhone uh, voice memos app. So this is totally possible. Um, many, uh, many audio guide providers out there um, I think really focus on the, um, the, a really lengthy um, production process that could cost anywhere from 10 to 100K. And um, this is um, in, in a sector where resources are really tight. Um, we'd like to offer a really smart way I think, um, for people to be able to do it themselves. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned, there are um, there are resources um, on our website. You can visit www.jasso.app, that's spelled with a G. Um, and then you can also find us on the App Store. Uh, we're just getting started and of course would like to 
um, to be a, a place, a home for stories about places um, and invite you to come contribute. Okay, terrific. Well, thank you so much. Um, those were two terrific presentations we had there from, from both Casey and Hannah. Um, I'm going to go ahead and throw off a couple of questions out there. But if you have questions um, in the audience, please um, send them in as well. Uh, I'm sure they would love to hear them and answer them. Um, let me go ahead and start with one for Casey. Um, Casey, when it comes to um, any kind of a sort of a 3D virtual recreation of a, of a, of a heritage site, seems like there's always some tension um, because, you know, I'll hear from some sites that say, I'm worried that if I make a great 3D site, tourists won't come in person anymore. They'll just watch the 3D. But on the other hand, I hear other sites say the opposite. They say, well, a good 3D site will encourage more tourists. Just from your perspective, what are you hearing out there in the world in, in, in 2021 um, from organizations that are thinking about doing a, a 3D cultural site of some sort? Yeah, I think that's something. Thank you, Brett. I think that's something that we've we've struggled with in the past, and and talking with sites and and making that that case. And and sometimes it is that sites were not interested in in participating in in the past um, and having a virtual representation. Uh, I think even the the highest fidelity 3D just pales into comparison with being there. I think it can get you close, but I think um, there's there's so much more. I think um, like audio or with or, or the the smells or the feelings that you you get when you're there is something that is really difficult to replicate even in the most uh, technical, technically sophisticated virtual reality applications. But in the last few, well, since the pandemic started, we, we've had at SciArc so much interest in, in utilizing historic data that maybe was captured previously for the purpose of conservation sites are how can we use this to provide virtual access to these places? I think that's something that we've heard over and over again. And I think now institutions, maybe because they were forced to, they're, they're having to think about um, what their digital strategy is going to be. And I think that's something that's really exciting is we've been able to kind of take that data that was captured in the past, maybe for a certain um, idea in mind, better to understand erosion or climate change impacts, and we could work with them and to develop some kind of virtual experience. And so that's something that we've been able to replicate in, I think, about 15, even just since the pandemic started, at 15 places, including sites here in the United States, like the National Park Service. We had partnered with them to do a study on Mesa Verde, which are these incredible cliff dwelling structures in southern Colorado. And, and the site was really interested in how could we take that data that was captured for the purposes of better understanding cracking, how could we use that data to create something that they could use um, for their distance learning modules and something that they could use to provide virtual access to those places. And so we've we've seen a ton of interest in, in using all the way from VR to the, the most simple panoramic photos. And so that's something really exciting, being able to kind of leverage that existing data going forward. Terrific, thank you very much. Um, let me throw a question out to Henna as well. Um, I want to follow up on something you talked about a little bit toward the end of your presentation, which is how does Jessa work with your client? Um, as you noted, there, there certainly are a number of toolkits out there already for creating geotag tours and the like. Um, I don't know, I'm curious from your perspective, when you work with an organization, is it often the case that they try to do it themselves and they, they didn't, they, they were unsuccessful? Um, what, 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 what do you kind of bring to the table to help an organization that's never done it before create a successful tour or, 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 or AR experience? Uh, many people find it really daunting to create uh, digital engagement. Um, many of the uh, partners that we have uh, range, range from a one-person, uh, one-room museum uh, that's in a historic artist studio, like Pollock Krasner House, uh, all the way to um, mid-sized museums uh, like the International Center of Photography and Museum. And of course, based on each institution's bandwidth and resources that are available to them, we have different um, different recommendations as to uh, what, what their uh, capacity is. And so um, for the for a zero budget or a shoestring budget, we have um, 
recommended equipment. Um, sometimes it's, it's, as I mentioned, an iPhone uh, or a smartphone recorder, voice memo app um, to um, uh, sort of pro tools um, used by audio producers. Um, and of course, we, we have an audio production team on staff that we often um, can, can lend um, either expertise or um, actual uh, support in production. Oh, terrific. Um, and actually, that, that makes me think of, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw a similar question back to Casey, because you talked about the fact that there's a range of different tools, some more expensive, some less expensive, and there's different ones that, that different clients could use. Um, Casey, you, you, you touched on photogrammetry. Um, and, I, you know, I, I remember I, I, I've, I've been funding um, kind of 3D virtual sites for almost 20 years. And, and back in the day, it was almost always using laser scanning which was very expensive, difficult to do, created very, very large data sets, which are difficult to process. But my impression is that photogrammetry has kind of changed the game, made it easier. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? How, is it, how, how has it changed over the last, say, 10 or 15 years? Yeah, certainly. I think yeah, you're, you're, you're correct. I think like laser scanners used to be the size of a small car and um, they needed power and it was very difficult to, to buy one and for an institution to purchase one. And, and you're right, the resulting data sets were very difficult to manipulate. And I think Cyric, like since the very beginning, we've been around for around 20 years, we, we've started using laser scanning. Um, and so we've, as the software has developed, I think that is really where the the, the changes that we've seen is with, with software. And so now you can take even photographs from an iPhone, um, put them into a software. Again, photographs taken in a very regimented way with photogrammetry. Again, you're, you're, you're moving your camera in a, in a regimented way around the object or the site, and then you're uploading that to a software. And I think, um, yeah, even, even five years ago when I started at SciArc, I, I've seen in the last five years like the software gets so much better at producing a, a, a good result in, in a much quicker turnaround. And so now you can you can throw in 10,000 images into a machine and, and kind of run that software for a couple hours and then you get a pretty amazing result. And I think, again, there were, there were challenges and roadblocks with the software in, in, in the beginning. I think there's, there's some options that are kind of free, um, but then you have um, like more Pay, pay for the input for the number of images. And so I think there's been some evolution in that as well. And so I think um, Cyric uses uh, Capturing Reality, which is free for educational institutions. And so that is what we encourage our partners to use um, on the projects that we, that we do. Terrific, thank you. Hey, I'm gonna turn to a couple of audience questions. I've got one for Hannah here. Uh, audience member writes, how does Gesso determine what sites or locations to create content about? How do you make sure that it is accessible and that the stories you choose to record are inclusive, especially in a place like New York City? That's a really great question and something that we're, um, that is very top of mind for us. Um, of course, in a city as diverse as New York, um, there's so many layers and different people's perspectives. Um, someone could have a totally uh, uh, different focus for um, the way they tell the story of a place. Um, as illustrated in my personal example. Um, how we uh, address this is we partner with um, different organizations and nonprofits that are already are really focused on uh, oral history. We're also about to put out a call for, um, uh, for proposals or a call for um, submissions actually for um, stories uh, about New York, stories about local heroes. Um, or New York memories. And so with that, uh, hoping to fill the gap of our own production teams, um, limited uh, bandwidth, of course. Um, what really uh, our process is um, knowing uh, the, uh, looking at some of the countercultural movements and looking for stories that inspire us. Um, most of what you, what you heard about today was developed um, actually in 2020. And um, we realized that as New Yorkers, half of the city emptied out, but we, we stayed and we realized there was so much inspiration um, to be sourced from resilient New Yorkers or resilient individuals who came before us. So it was really, um, I think, humbling and rewarding to map those stories and continue to add to it. Terrific, thank you so much. 
All right, let's take a look here. I think we've got a couple more audience questions. Um, ha, here's an interesting one um, for Casey. Um, how does SciR contend with the likes of Google Culture? There we go, I'm unmuted. Um, and Google, is that Google Arts and Culture? Is that- I, I think that's probably what they meant, yeah. Um, so, um, I'm not quite sure. Google Arts and Culture is a platform, I think, that cultural institutions use to to share their, I think it's artistic, um, like photographs or images. Cyrk is a, is a user of Google Arts and Culture as a platform to share um, the materials that we produce. They have a 3D viewer that kind of fits into their platform, I think. Um, you you apply to become a member of Google Arts and Culture, and then um, then there is some some process. I think a, a vetting. Um, Casey, I think we're having trouble hearing you. Um, to share our material sometimes um, do we have internet oh unfortunately I, I think Casey is frozen can I I can't hear you Casey okay Sorry about that. Um, here we go. I think Casey's trying to reconnect here. Let's see if we can get him in back again. Okay. Well, I'm sorry to say, I think we've lost the connection. Uh, but of course, that's that's uh, welcome to the year 2021. <laughs> um, I'm checking out my questions. I think those are all the audience questions we have thus far. So considering that we are just about out of time and it's a Friday, um, why don't we go ahead and, and wrap up the meeting? Let me thank, uh, give my, my big thanks to Meridian and also to our, our three speakers in this panel. They were all terrific presentations. I really appreciate your time and uh, putting in all the, the important work that you do. In the, in the cultural heritage and digital humanities um, universe. So thank you all very much. And everybody, please have a terrific weekend. Thank you so much. Well, I'd like to thank everyone around the world today for joining the Global Humanities Initiative, uh, the partnership with uh, National Endowment for the Humanities and Meridian Center for Cultural Diplomacy. Uh, it was a meaningful day. We learned a lot and it's only the beginning of this multi-year partnership where we hope to continue to explore the themes which have been raised, explore new ones, and focus on the power of cultural diplomacy to unite people uh, in the United States uh, and abroad. And I think uh, people throughout the United States uh, all share an interest uh, in international culture, be it from their own historical perspectives and personal stories, their communities uh, in America, and, and obviously our role in the world as a partner and leader uh, in, uh, in the global uh, economy and uh, in advancing uh, peace and prosperity. So thank you again for joining us.